Thank you so much for the great talks. Thank you for our speakers. So we um, uh, jump right into the next uh, track, Data Science for Social Good. And I'm going to start by introducing our next speakers, uh, Elodie and Yara. Elodie is, um, brings 13 years of ex emergency experience and uh, leads humanitarian projects in uh, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. She holds a master's degree in political science um, and master's in, uh, uh, of sciences in the public health from the Johns Hopkins University and Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, she's been a technical advisor and capacity building manager for uh, NGOs, and her technical expertise cuts across sectors. She joined the Africa Infodemic Response Alliance as the country support lead, and the role cons and and she um, she's now the coordinator for WHO Afro, and her role is to mobilize and coordinate efforts between UN agencies, NGO, uh, media organizations, and research uh, institutes to limit the spread of misinformation in Africa. Our um, second speaker with uh, Elodie, Yara Moussaoui. She's an experienced regional emergency infodemic management lead with WHO Africa, with 12 years of uh, demonstrated history of working in humanitarian risk, communication, community engagement, and social behavior change. Uh, Yara has supported several United Nations and um, INGOs, um, emergency responses in Lebanon, the MENA region, Europe, and more recent, recently Africa. She has strongly highlighted issues facing vulnerable population since the onset of the Syrian refugee crisis, the COVID, and uh, multiple health emergencies uh, in Africa. She holds a master's degree from, of sociology from AUB. And um, we welcome our speakers. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, yes. Um, thank you for those who stayed in the room. I know that we're all sad we didn't have a break, so we truly appreciate that you're still with us um, for this uh, talk. So I'm Elodie. I'm the coordinator of an alliance that I will uh, describe a little bit later. But I just wanted to have a very quick survey here in the room. So who has heard about infodemics? Raise your hand. I see a few hands. Oh, I'm actually surprised that there are that many hands. But infodemics, for those who didn't hear about infodemics before, I can give you a hint. So infodemics is the combination of information and epidemics. Because as you heard before, I work for WHO. And it is very important for us, of course, to monitor epidemics. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, there was another epidemic, which was not related to the disease per se, but it was related to information. And infodemics is basically when there is too much information. And people are not able to decipher if it's true or not true. Because remember, during COVID-19, everybody were a self-proclaimed epidemiologist. Huh? Everybody was sharing you know, what they know about COVID-19 or other diseases. So it was very, very challenging for people, especially in Africa, um, to get access to the correct information in time and also information that they will understand in a very simple way. Um, when we talk about infodemics, so for those who know what it means, you may have heard a lot about disinformation and misinformation. So disinformation, I'm going to start with misinformation, it's easier. Misinformation is basically an information that is inaccurate. It can be a little bit true, a little bit false. Usually it's kind of a mix of both. Disinformation, it's an inaccurate information, but that is spread uh, intentionally to do harm, to manipulate opinion. So for example, when I say vaccines don't work, and I know I'm a scientist, I know it works, but I'm telling you it doesn't work, this is disinformation. I'm trying to manipulate your opinion. Um, there's also something, and this is uh, quite common actually when there's an outbreak, this is what we call information gaps. 
when there is no information or people don't understand the, the information that is out there. For example, there is uh, the Marburg vir virus that we're dealing with in Africa. And there are a lot of questions. How does it transmit? Um, what are the symptoms? And there was not a lot of information. So this is an information gap. So for those who have not, never been to Africa or never worked in Africa, what does it mean when you're a public health specialist to work in Africa on infodemics? So we have the youngest population in the world. It's a huge continent. 1.3 billion uh, people in Africa. And among those 1.3 billion, you have 40% of them who are under 15 years old. What does it mean also in terms of information that you're going to share with them? Because you cannot share something necessarily that is too scientific, let's say, or too complicated to a 15 years old person. Um, uh, sorry. So now there is uh, more and more access to internet. It's all over the place, including Africa. But there are a lot of differences between uh, countries and also within a country. So in the North African countries, for example, 80% uh, of the population has access to internet, which is very high. But in sub-Saharan uh, countries, the average is 30%, which is quite low. But again, here, because the sub-Saharan uh, sub-region is quite vast, you have countries like Nigeria, where you, ha where you have 70% uh, of the population with access to internet, which is very high, again. But then next to Nigeria, or very, very close to Nigeria, you have Niger, and Niger, it's only 10%. So here in the same uh, area, you have a lot of differences. Um, so internet also means social media. Um, and in our continent, Facebook is the most used social media platform, uh, which, is, which means a lot of things in terms of infodemic management. And also, so some people have access to social media and internet, but a lot of people still don't. And they don't rely on social media to uh, get their information about health. So they rely a lot on the radio, on TV, on communities, on their barbershop, you know, on their teachers, on their nurses, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what we call offline information, and this is still extremely important in our work. Um, those with a public health um, background, so the African context, unfortunately, you know, you have a lot of cliches about uh, the, the continent, and um, WHO and other partners are dealing uh, at the moment with multiple outbreaks and humanitarian emergencies. It's not everywhere, but unfortunately, some of the countries that are affected by uh, diseases are also affected by um, uh, humanitarian emergencies. I mentioned Marburg. There's also cholera. Cholera that has uh, more severe effects this year, unfortunately, because of climate change. You have monkeypox, you have COVID-19, you have polio, measles, you name it, you know? So what is our work as Africa Infodemic Response Alliance? IRA. So IRA is a hosted, WHO hosted network. So we are not just one person, not just one organization. We were launched in December 2020. So at that time, uh, COVID-19, of course, was, was there, but the vaccines were not there uh, yet. And it was very important, basically, for those organizations that you see on the screen to um, gather and basically pool our expertise and resources to fight misinformation and disinformation. Because it was already um, out there, but with the arrival of the vaccines, we thought that it was, it's, going, it will, um, it will, it's going to be worse. So there was a need, clearly, to prevent before uh, misinformation be becomes under, uh, out of control. Um, so maybe just one quick thing about IRA. So I said that we are um, an alliance of multiple organizations. And maybe here, the unique thing about IRA is that, of course, you have big actors like UNICEF, IFR IFRC, but you also have non-traditional humanitarian actors, such as fact-checking organizations. You have PESA check, you have uh, Africa check, 
you have uh, Dubai, AFP. So you have all these media and fact-checking organizations who help us also to depollute, let's say, the information environment so then people have access to the right information in the right time. Um, it's extremely challenging also in our continent to listen to what is uh, being discussed, you know, online and offline, but prioritize also because there are so many things going on at the same time, as I showed you before. So what do we do to make sense and not be depressed, basically, with all the things happening? So we use a method, and this is very, very, uh, a very simple um, explanation of how we proceed. So the first step is we identify the conversation, the problem. What is the problem? Where, um, where is the gap? Uh, where do you have too much information and not necessarily good quality information? And so on and so forth. We simplify the message that we want to uh, deliver. We amplify the correct information and we quantify uh, the impact that our communication messages, but also our other interventions, and we're going to talk about that, um, the impact that it has basically on people's behavior, on trust, on different outcomes, basically. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Yaha, thank you. Thank you so much, Elodie. So now we'll go into the concrete stuff and examples, and we'll share really very interesting examples from our work in Africa. So how do you use data to manage infodemic, uh, infodemics within Africa? As, as Elodie has mentioned, the African context is, is challenging. I won't say difficult, but it's, it is challenging. There's a lot of diversity, a lot of languages used, a lot of different uh, backgrounds, ethnicities. So what do we do? Social listening for us within IRA is really capturing all of the conversation. Whenever we, we hear something, wherever we hear something. I know it is something that is very overwhelming, but infodemics is something that is overwhelming. We try as much as we can to use different tools, quantitative, qualitative. Yes, we conduct social listening online, social media listening, but however, it's not limited only to this. We also do focus group discussions, we hear what this local barbershop is disseminating within the street. We understand and we capture what the religious leaders, uh, how they are influencing and what they are sharing within their communities. So we try as much as we can to get multiple sources of data. We get also our data from radios, TVs, press, because as Elodie has mentioned, data internet penetration is high in some contexts in some countries in Africa but very low in other contexts. In some uh, countries like the DRC, in Kinshasa, the radio baladeur, the use of radios is incredibly, um, and, uh, is very much disseminated, maybe even more than social media and even more than WhatsApp. And we have captured a lot of misinformation and disinformation from these radios. So what do we do? The key steps for us to really gather all of this over, overwhelming data. The first thing that we do is that we, when we identify these sources, we put a, a key um, infodemic report that really highlights the trends that we are seeing. Uh, we identify and we select the data sources. We conduct an integrated analysis of each platform, Facebook, TikTok, if possible, these, the community conversations, what's happening within this context, within this province. Then we develop strategies and recommendations for each platform that we are working on. How can we really debunk or pre-bunk sometimes this uh, misinformation? What, is, what, what can we advise the country office to develop as content? We, do we disseminate content now that rectifies the misinformation or we keep it to after? So all of this really uh, depends on the context and from the experience of the things that we have worked before. We develop the infodemic insights report and we disseminate and track this dissemination to see and to watch if people have taken this recommendation, if they have, if they have applied it well, and how we can we improve it. And this is an example of our weekly info infodemic trends report. You can see we focus on trends on a weekly basis, what can we do about it, and what are the resources that you can use to try to pre-bunk, debunk, rectify 
this fake news, this disinformation, this disinformation that you are hearing. And this is a very recent example that happened with us in DRC. So, two weeks ago, a uh, Marburg misinformation was shared to our network, our network of volunteers. And it was shared and it was created by a very known uh, journalist in DRC. The main claim was that Marburg is transmitted by walking on the same floor of an infected person. As from our experience and from the data that we have and from the fact sheets of uh, WHO, this is misinformation and this is not correct and this is not how Marburg, Marburg is uh, transmitted. So what we did is that we verified the information and we didn't contact the journalist ourselves. What we did is that we contacted uh, the country office of DRC and this is where I want to focus on. Throughout our work, we build the capacity of country offices. We uh, systemize, we strengthen systems of infodemic management, we provide the tools, we provide the knowledge, we provide the capacity building, but it's not us who, who does the work. We empower the country offices for them to take the steps and to mobilize themselves to try to manage the misinformation and disinformation. Like we mentioned, we cannot stop these rumors, these misinformation, but what we can do is that we can manage them. So the country officers, yes, they contacted the, uh, the journalist, uh, and he is a very known journalist who has a lot of reach and has a, lot, a big audience. And they rectified and rectify, uh, the uh, rectif rectification was issued, but then what followed is that the country office of DRC, which is a big country office, they started to issue and to produce more and more of um, content that focus on the right transmission um, and how that Marburg is uh, actually transmitted. So it took us less than one day, one day let's say, and we were able to, uh, the country office was able to, um, to uh, solve this misinformation. And what's good to know that it was a misinformation, it wasn't a disinformation, meaning that he had the wrong information about Marburg and it made it easier for us to try to rectify it. We know that if it was a dis uh, disinformation, a person who is on purpose uh, trying to disseminate the wrong information, it would, have been more, um, it would have been more difficult and more challenging. But, we, uh, but misinformation also very much pertained in the, um, uh, present in the healthcare uh, world and the humanitarian world, so we were able to, uh, to solve this quickly. So as we mentioned that we are quick facilitators, proactively mobilizing but we build the capacity for the country offices for them to take the lead on. So what we do as well, we work with the 47 Af uh, African countries within the WHO Afro region. How do we build the systems of infodemic management? The first thing to do is to understand what is the uh, information ecosystem that's happening in Lebanon, uh, in, the, in the country. Is it the use of, do they have a high use of social media? Do they have good data penetration or no? Do they rely more on offline uh, resources? Do they focus more? Do they trust more religious leaders or no? So this is what we try to understand from the beginning. We train the media because from our recent um, experience here in Lebanon, let's take the example of Lebanon during the COVID-19 pandemic, we remember very well that some of the media were the source of misinformation and disinformation. So for us, training the media is a key point and is a key action that we focus on. But not only this, train the media on them to detect misinformation, disinformation, and them to share the right information on the modes of transmission, let's say. We develop with the country office the workflow from the start to the beginning of infodemic management. And we also support and guide on the production of content. But what we really focus on is on the lo localization. Yes, we, we support in the production of content we guide, but we leave it with the country offices for them to localize based on their context. There are many languages in, in all of these countries other than the official languages. In DRC alone, we have four official languages, but more than 100 local lang languages that are used. So one country office cannot really um, meet all of the needs of the localization and of translation. So they focus more on the provinces, country uh, mini, uh, mini offices, and they enable them by themselves. Uh, their, uh, they enable the smaller uh, offices. What we also work on is on 
monitoring, that whenever we disseminate anything, we, we allocate a lot of work and a lot of time and effort on the post-dissemination uh, monitoring to understand what worked well and what should be really uh, improved. And we conduct community feedback or survey. If you remember that uh, throughout the pandemic here in Lebanon, uh, the hotlines of 1214 and 1787. So these uh, were good resources to get the feedback of people to uh, understand what, what are their questions, what are the misinformation they're capturing, and this is something that we also rely on and we encourage in within the realm of, realm of uh, WHO Africa to focus on the community feedback. Thank you. So um, why, why do we talk to you about um, these kind of things? I just want to check if that works. This is actually a real life example from Malawi. And I'll let you watch the video quickly. Okay, so without speaking the local language, what did you see here? You saw a lot of people running towards a direction. Um, a lot of people, you have young people, women, men, really running, um, you don't necessarily know without understanding the language why they're doing that. But basically, the context here is that these people are from the same village around um, uh, in, in Malawi, and they were all running all together to a cholera treatment center in Balaka. And basically, what did they want to, to do uh, by running to this uh, treatment center? They actually sacked the treatment center and they attacked the people there. Why? Because they heard rumors. They heard that the uh, healthcare workers who were working in that treatment center were actually the source of the cholera outbreak because a lot of people were questioning cholera was real. And basically they said that, no, these are the ones who are injecting us with the virus. There were also other rumors about um, organ harvesting. So basically, the people who died in uh, this center and other centers, the, the rumor was that the healthcare workers were harvesting their organs and selling them. So of course, they were not happy about that. And uh, other rumors were also due to COVID-19, because unfortunately, the pandemic has really negatively affected the trust of many people in um, healthcare interventions and um, basically healthcare agencies too. So um, they thought that, they, they, they were talking that people were receiving IVs, they were receiving injections, but they didn't know what they were receiving. And they said that they received the COVID-19 vaccine and they didn't want it. So all this basically created a storm and people rushed to uh, sack that treatment center. It happened there in Balaka and it happened also in Ilongwe, which is the capital city of Malawi. So you can see concretely also on the effects of what misinformation can do, and especially when it's uh, spread on social media, because it can spread like that, like wildfire. And um, our job basically is to detect the signals before these kind of things happen. Of course, like we can um, wave you know, red flags and things like that, but uh, our job is also part of uh, a broader approach, a broader response. Because here, um, you cannot talk about infodemic management without talking about health system strengthening. Because if you don't have enough uh, trained staff, if you don't have good quality of care, if you don't have vaccines available, things like that, this is when people are starting to complain or making up things or discussing about um, false information. Uh, that will feed into, you know, the distrust that unfortunately already exists in some communities. Um. Okay, so what did we do? Because, of course, it looks scary, but what can you do uh, about it? So, as I said, there are also other colleagues who work on strengthening the system itself. We have also a lot of colleagues who are doing risk communication and community engagement. So going door to door, 
listening to people and also explaining what they received, you know, in the IV. Uh, that basically the cholera vaccine is not an injection. It's uh, something, um, it's an oral vaccine. So, you know, explaining things like that, basic facts, uh, going to communities can help. On social media, what we do also in, uh, at our level is um, because that rumor was also spread on social media, we produce uh, very short and engaging uh, videos to explain also uh, what is going on. So there is an example here too, if we have time. I just wanted to show this one because basically it was designed for Malawi to address a specific misinformation, but there were 23 million views. So it really went beyond Malawi because there was a high need for people to get this kind of information. <laughs> That video was also uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Health in Malawi. So this is just an example. We have many other formats. But um, now, what did we learn for the past three years? Because we are a uh, recent alli alliance, and infodemic management is an emerging field. But we've learned already some stuff. So uh, over to you, Aya. Thank you, Aledui. We're very happy to share with you what we've learned. Uh, and I know that. Um, if taken well, these uh, recommendations can, and the lessons learned and best practices can be adapted to different contexts. Uh, so what we have learned that um, you cannot conduct social listening by itself, and you, can, you cannot start with it alone. Meaning that you cannot start with identifying the data resources, compiling that, and all of this. No, you should have a strong system of infodemic management built in country offices, like what happened in DRC, like what happened as well in Malawi, because we, also, we were also requested on several support missions. So you need to have this strong support, this strong system that is already take, uh, put in place, and then you can start with your social listening and uh, identifying your data resources. Uh, capacity building in country offices works, works very well. The centralization of management, infodemic management, uh, whatever it is, is not as efficient as building the capacity of country offices and really capacitating and building uh, the strength and the systematization of the country offices because they know the local, uh, the, the context better, they speak the language and they know the traditions, uh, how things work better than um, someone who is out from outside the country. Uh, the consistent, uh, consistency on using the data, the, the, so, uh, the uh, social listening reports. Whenever these reports are produced, they are efficient because they show you what is being talked about now and this, during this week and uh, during this week, and things change very, very quickly. So using them is really saves you time, saves you money, and also is very efficient and really helps you in producing engaging content and engaging material. Combining online and offline sources, social media listening is not sufficient alone at all, at all, at all. You need to combine offline. You need to know what this province in, uh, in Malawi, in um, 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 what is happening in Zanzibar, what they are talking uh, in, in, in a town, 
a rural town that does not have a data, high data penetration, internet penetration. Exchanging lessons and best practices between African countries is very important. Although the context is different, but we can definitely agree on and find in common best practices. And localized content is, uh, is very important, like we mentioned, and strength of the network. Having a network, a strong network of volunteers who can tip you, if you can say so, provide you with, in, uh, with insights, with, with uh, social listening uh, data, especially from the offline sources, is very efficient for your work. The challenges. Um, we have many competing needs for epidemic management because we need to focus on capacity building. We need to focus on um, data, uh, social listening, on research. So there are, there are some competing needs for this, uh, this science because as Elodie mentioned, it's an emerging science. Many competing humanitarian priorities because unfortunately we all know the different contexts in Africa because in different zones there are conflicts, there are outbreaks of diseases which sometimes, actually a lot of times, they make the priorities shift and very quickly. Social media monitoring tools have their limits. We cannot control everything that is being disseminated on WhatsApp and we cannot control everything that is being and monitor everything that's being uh, disseminated in the closed Facebook groups. And there's a lot of things that are being um, um, disseminated there and shared, and especially on WhatsApp, because it costs less and it is very flexible to use everywhere and indefinitely in the African context. Gaps in online data regulation. The dead internet penetration in the African context is on the rise. Even if in some countries it's still low, but it is on the rise. So because we have now overwhelming and increase of internet usage, now we also have an overwhelming increase of misinformation and disinformation. And it is being a bit more, um, let's say, um, more challenges, uh, challenging for us to keep track of because things are shifting very, very fast. And we really need to be abreast of all of the changes that are happening. Uh, so this is it from my side. Over to you, Elodie. Well, over to the room, I think. Huh? This was our last slide, so I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, it's great. Okay, so we'll open the floor for one question. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm really interested about the part related to social media listening. And I would like to know that if in general you face a challenge related to uh, limited resources, related to the mission that you're uh, doing, uh, and what are, what are the tools that you are using and the technologies that are helping you, and how are you bridging the challenge of the language differences? Yeah, so it's related to the technology and three different challenges, mainly. I would like to answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay, thank you so much. Regarding the first, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a question of three parts. I hope I remember them all. Uh, regarding the issue of uh, when we have overwhelming issues, we prioritize, especially when there are uh, crises. So when we had the uh, cholera outbreak in Malawi, we prioritized what is being uh, talked about on cholera in Malawi. We dropped the other conversations. That's one. That's one. The other thing regarding the online social listening, uh, what are the tools? We use a mix of tools. Let's uh, keep the offline ones uh, on the side, but for the online, we use CrowdTangle. We use a platform that is developed by WHO EARS, E-A-R-S. We use also TalkWalker, uh, Google, uh, Google Analytics, and it's a mix of different, different, different tools. Uh, regarding the third one of uh, the language barrier, it is, it, this is a big challenge of us. 
So this is why you focus a lot on the capacity building of the country offices. What happens is that the capacity building of country offices and our large um, network of volunteers. So whenever we received as the regional group, the regional team, any misinformation, disinformation, not through the country office, let's say, we quickly, we identify where is the source, which country it is, and we um, share it with the specific and uh, country um, uh, office. Let's say, uh, what do you have? Let's, say, let's say in Ethiopia. So they deal with it and share with us what is the reaction and what uh, is the countering uh, and uh, countering message. And uh, also what we do as well is that we build their capacity on localizing the content that we have. VFA, the Viral Facts Africa, we have it in English, we have it in French, and sometimes in Spanish. They take it, they translate it, they localize, they shift, again, they edit some, uh, some things, and they disseminate it to their network. So we build their capacity, and we empower them in a way for them to localize and for them to take it on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the thing is about our team, like, like there's two Lebanese in this team. Uh, and each Lebanese <laughs> speaks three languages, and the others, they speak other languages, English, French, and maybe Spanish. So we cannot really uh, cover all of the African languages. So we try as uh, much as we can to focus on the country offices. Thank you. Thank you, Elodie. Thank you, Yara.